Okay, here's an easy one. Finish the game! No! Buckle up, punks. It's time we talked about one of the 80s best cyberpunk classics. Released in 1982, Charm was ahead of its time. The cutting edge CGI blended well with his state of the art film techniques to show audiences what a person would look like inside of a computer. Jeff Bridges portrays Flynn, once a premier programmer who has resorted to either playing video games in his own arcade or hacking into his old job at Incom. He teams up with his friends to show how current Incom CEO Ed Dillinger, played by David Warner, stole credit for one of Incom's premier games, Space Paranoids. Dillinger has issues of his own, as former chess program Master Computer has taken over the Incom mainframe. Feeling threatened by Flynn, Master Computer lasers him into his world. Yep, it's a laser. Just a sci-fi laser doing sci-fi things. Flynn is then transported to the mainframe, an entire world of programs who look like their users who built them. Oh man, this isn't happening with all the things that's happening. Along with light cycles, cyberdelic sites, and video game inspired challenges, Flynn has to team up with Super Program Tron to take back control from Master Computer in the electronic world and Dillinger in the physical one. Director Steven Lisberger was first inspired to make Tron when he was an animator. He saw footage from the arcade classic Pong and wanted to incorporate video games into a major motion picture. With his expertise in the creative team at Wang Studio Productions, he was able to create a film so far ahead of its time, it was destined to become a cult classic. Interesting note, the animators at Disney Studios refused to work on this project. They believed CGI was leading me at the door of hand-drawn animation, another aspect of this film that was ahead of its time. Much of what makes it work is the CGI used in the film. For the first time, computer-generated imagery was shown to a public audience on a massive scale. You want horizons in cyberspace mountain ranges? You got it. What? You said you didn't even know you wanted what you wanted? Bam! I got a two for going. Tron definitely cut the path of the future of animation. It would still be 13 years before Disney, while teaming up with Pixar, was able to bring a completely CGI movie to mass appeal with Toy Story. When it came to dialogue scenes, the actors were filmed in black and white. In post-production, each film was colorized to add the cyber effects of these avatars being walking, talking programs. Also, the damn thing is just fun to watch. The programs and Flynn play games and give chase, wonderfully blending CGI and live action actors for a unique film experience. It's Star Wars rules. Good guys are blue, bad are red. It's no wonder so many kids who loved it when it came out grew up to become computer programmers and animators. Okay, we can't talk about the epic cyberspace adventure that is Tron without talking about light cycles. I mean, an exciting light cycle scene opens the film. Seriously, we don't know who anyone is or what's happening. But the movie throws out some bad guys on light cycles, obliterating the competition in the first few minutes. One part Blade Runner and all kinds of Akira, the light cycles are mostly used for competition. Teams of threes will compete and attempt to demolish the other team. When the cycles go, they leave a stream of light solidified forming a wall. It becomes a game of cat and mouse, when one program tries to get an opposing program to either hit the outer wall or one from the light cycle. It's exciting, puzzling, and brutal. When Flynn teams up with Tron and Ram for the first time, their teamwork makes the dream work in escaping those cycles. What was once a competition now becomes a chase, as the three light cycles are on the run from tanks and whatever those things are in space paranoids. It's as exciting as watching a real car chase. Okay, maybe not as good as Bullet or Death Proof, but as good as anything seen in the Fast and Furious films. The light cycles in Tron are so much of a staple of the franchise that it's the number one thing that comes back in sequels and spin-offs. Tron Legacy was able to take it to the next level, but it had a solid foundation of charm and excitement thanks to its use in Tron. Include the occasional Family Guy reference and you got the making of a cyberpunk film that endears cult status. The character of Tron is so great in this film. He's not even the main character and they still named the movie after him. Alan Bradley, played by Bruce Boxleitner, is one of Flynn's former co-workers in Incom. His entire division has been locked out of the mainframe for security checks. When addressing Dillinger, he's assured that Master Computer has everything under control. That is precisely what Bradley is worried about. Hmm. To better Watchdog MC, Bradley builds a program named Tron. Tron's job is to monitor communication between the mainframe and the real world. So on the surface, we have a guy building a program because he doesn't trust his boss. Understood. But inside of the Incom mainframe, you have this former sheriff turned into a redemption story. Tron is stuck playing games and dominating. It's only when he escapes that he can become the hero on the poster. This is the time where video game characters started having their own personalities. The first Super Mario Bros. didn't hit until 1985. Folks didn't care about the Adventures of Link until 1986 when The Legend of Zelda was released. Since Tron is both a movie and a video game, 
it's safe to say that he was one of the first memorable video game characters. Box Lightning does a great job portraying two characters. Hell, everyone does. There are the real life counterparts with their jobs and hidden motives, but the programs inside the mainframe are glorified archetypes, surviving in a strange cyberspace. Bradley is a smart programmer who was wary of renegades, but Tron is like Ethan Hunt in Mission Impossible. This guy couldn't get hurt if he tried. While in the Incom mainframe, Flynn is mostly at a disadvantage. Besides playing for his life, he has no idea what's going on for quite a while. The only advantage he has is being the user who invented damn near every game played. Convenient, huh? We see this with the light cycles. He's able to communicate with Tron and Ram exactly what they need to do to win and escape. But what's funny is when Flynn tries to fly one of those robot looking machines that is used in his game, Space Paranoids. The machine is a bit busted so it doesn't exactly fly straight. He's able to maneuver it decently enough once he realizes the controls are identical to that of the arcade game. Yes, the exact same game we see Flynn dominating when he is introduced at the beginning of the film. But the good times doesn't last as he crashes just shy of his destination. Also, the other programs he crashes near obviously go to the same school of behavior as the villagers of Hyrule, because they barely bat an eye. Oh, this town is full of live ones. Tron was ahead of its time and is still revered as a sci-fi favorite. It gave people a better understanding of what computers could do. This was necessary in the age where at-home PCs were becoming more and more commonplace. Sure, it's not an exact representation of computer engineering as programs aren't alive, have emotions, and fall in love. But it did normalize computing ideas and terms. Whether you're watching it for the first or 50th time, Tron is one of the classic cyberpunk movies. What do you think? Let us know down in the comments below. And make sure to subscribe for all latest cyberpunk videos, where we tell you what you've got to see. You're very persistent, Tron! I'm also better than you!